Thank you. Um, so the title of my presentation is Global Ebook Domination Through Better Metadata because that sounds much more interesting than tax or rama and I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about international taxes and we'll try to make it as interesting as possible. <laughs> um, so my role as Director of Content Management um, basically means for, for me and my team that we're responsible for making sure that we're getting all of the books that our customers want to have um, up on site quickly and accurately. So we're taking in books, we're adding thousands of new books to the catalog each day, and we're adding them from, um, I think from multiple countries now are coming in, and making sure that those books are listed as well across all of the territories that we serve. Um, we work really closely with people like BookNet and BISG to make sure that we're following the, the standards, and also to communicate back to them where we're seeing publishers experience difficulty. Um, Right now at Kobo, we have, tw uh, this probably is out of date. I feel like every time I update it, I'm adding another million on this. Um, so we're 12 million global users, probably 13 by now. Um, Award-winning devices, our, our devices recently won um, the Parent Tested Parent Approved Award for our Kobo Arc. Uh, we're selling eBooks into 190 countries. Um, we have 3.2 million books in 68 different languages, and we have 14 country-specific stores. So when we talk about country-specific stores, um, I'm referring to kind of the model that Kobo has. Uh, this is kind of a bit of uh, the map of where we've gone so far. So Kobo's model, um, which most of you are familiar with, it's nice to speak to a Canadian audience that's all very familiar with, with Kobo and our relationship with Indigo. Um, we usually try to partner with the largest bookstore in a territory that we launch in. So the reason for that is that, you know, people that are going into bookstores, browsing and buying their devices there are already readers, and they're more likely to use their device to buy books, unlike someone who's gone to purchase an iPad who's going to use it to play Angry Birds most of the time and might buy some books as well. Um, we like to partner with the bookstores. We do sell our devices in places like Future Shop as well, but the customers that we get from a bookstore are a much better customer and they purchase more titles. So this is kind of, these are the countries that we're in now. I'm gonna spend some time at the end of the presentation going kind of country by country to explain who we're partnered with and where your books will be if you give us rights to sell in that country. So one of the biggest things that uh, our team works with when we get questions from publishers um, every time we launch, we usually end up with a series of emails like this. So, you know, why can't I see my book on your German partner site? Um, we get a lot of questions as well when we send out our sales reports of, well, why did you pay me this amount here? I don't remember sending you that price. Um, or why didn't you use this other price I gave you? We get a lot of questions about providing local pricing. Um, every time we launch in a new territory, uh, there's often a lot of questions of what currency do they even use somewhere like South Africa? Uh, what is the exchange rate like? What is the average ebook price like? Uh, do our taxes included and excluded? So these are the kind of questions we get. Um, when we do kind of research why, we tend to come back to the onyx. And almost all the time, the cause of why books aren't up, why they're up at the wrong price, is usually due to ambiguous metadata. So it's usually due to publishers not being explicit with certain key fields uh, to do with their international distribution. So one of the things I really want to focus on today is to be explicit and understand what you're sending. Um, I think that this is a really important issue to discuss, the global distribution, just because it's something that we see publishers of all sizes dealing with today. Some of the errors that I'm going to talk about in my presentation are things that we've seen anywhere from self-publishers to do to the largest, you know, multinational uh, companies. It's something that everyone's kind of struggling with, so we did want to take some time to go over it. So. I'm going to discuss a few general issues that we see with metadata related to global sales. I'm going to go country by country and talk about uh, details specific to those currencies and to our partners in those territories. And then at the end, I'll leave some time for questions. So one of the things that we talk about um, a lot when we're, talk when we're launching a new territory is talking to publishers about their pricing strategy. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today on what the actual value of those prices should be. I think that's a whole other presentation and um, something that's debated a lot. But what I want to talk about is how to make sure that your pricing strategy is being respected and that it is clear in all of the countries that you're selling in. Um, so one of the first steps is really just to have a pricing strategy. We do have a lot of publishers that are just sending out a local price and expecting it to be converted into all the local currencies, which is something we can do, but also something to be aware that you are doing that deliberately. There are a lot of advantages to providing a local price. Um, there's a lot of reasons that publishers haven't been doing that up to this point. Uh, there's often long lead times. Currencies haven't been as stable. Um, you don't know how long your book's going to be on the shelf. So, and it's printed on the label. 
Um, we've had a lot of publishers saying that they don't want, they're still providing different prices in U.S. dollars because they want to use it as a hedge against currency fluctuations. But the Canadian and U.S. dollar have been at par for over six years now and, you know, with fluctuations that are quite minor. Um, with daily metadata updates, um, we have 48-hour price, price processing SLAs, and there are no prices printed on eBooks. So there is a lot of flexibility to experiment here. Um, you might not want to add a separate currency on all of your books, but on a particular type of books. Uh, you might notice that a lot of your mysteries are selling really well in uh, the Netherlands, for example. And it's really easy to add euros onto those books, test it out, see how it's working for you. You can remove it at any time. When I do this talk to the US publishers, I spend a lot of time talking about the you know, taking their pricing strategy and adding $2, and then that's their Canadian pricing strategy. Um, but one of the things that I think is more unique to the Canadian market is how publishers are dealing with parity and what that means internally and how that can be communicated. So some of the different strategies that we see is, you know, the first one that I mentioned of publishers that are just sending out one Canadian dollar price and having it being converted into other territories, such as U.S. dollars as well. Um, you know, the currencies are very close to parity, so you might expect your 999 price is also going to be 999 in the U.S. But there are still those small fluctuations, and if you're not explicitly saying and send it 990, sell it 999 in U.S., you can end up with, um, you know. 1007 as your US dollar price, which is definitely uh, far less psychologically uh, of compelling of a price as the 999. One of the other ways that we see it done is sending, you know, US dollar and Canadian prices at the same value. So, you know, sending a 999 Canadian, 999 US dollars. Um, that's definitely a really good way, not, or not a good necessarily the best way of doing it, but also it's the most explicit way. You know, you want to be in control of your data and you want to understand what's being sent out. One of the mistakes that we often see, though, from publishers that are taking that strategy is when they're doing promotions or sales, they're not then changing both. So if they're doing a promotion in Canada, lowering the price to $7.99, that U.S. dollar price is still $9.99. Um, and often the media that's being produced to support that promotion is available to both territories. And then there are some publishers that are still sending a cheaper U.S. dollar price as well as the trends of what they're doing with their print book, um, you know, taking their Canadian pricing strategy, removing a dollar or two. Um, and that's, you know, fine as well. But what we would say is to continue to experiment and test with it. Uh, one of the things we talk about a lot at Kobo is pricing optimization. And it's important to be doing these tests and see where you're making more money. Um, you know, sometimes lowering $2, you're leaving money on the table. And it's important to test out the pricing and see what's working best for you. Um, we're seeing things get even more cloudy as we move into other English language territories. So Australia, and New Zealand, and UK, we're seeing even more publisher confusion as you move beyond the US. And one of the reasons for that is taxes. So it's really important when you're pricing books to understand how taxes are being included in the prices and to understand how it's presented to consumers in those territories. Um, when creating your pricing strategy, you should know which price the customer is looking at. So, you know, in North America, we're used to seeing, you know, and I, I keep going back to the 999 example. I'm not saying prescribing that as a value that you should use, but just uh, for purposes of example to you know, we know that it's 9.99. We know we're not going to pay an even number at the checkout. It's going to be, you know, depending on your province, uh, different tax rates. Publishers aren't concerned about creating a uniform price at the end that the customer is going to pay once their taxes are added in, but they are concerned about having a uniform list price across all of the provinces and states. Um, whereas in the UK and almost everywhere else that we sell at Kobo, particularly, you're you want to gear your strategy towards a tax inclusive price. Uh, and tax inclusive pricing gets there. There are also a few different ways of doing it. So this was, you know, a, a nice kind of visual that I found um, over Wikipedia. That's why it's hundred dollars. I don't suggest that anyone price their eBooks at hundred dollars, uh, but just as a good way of explaining um, the differences between tax inclusive and tax exclusive, but also to show you a the second way of tax inclusive pricing. So if we were to look at $100 as being the final amount that a customer would spend, um, something that's interesting about uh, tax inclusive pricing is that it's taken off the final amount. So if you wanted the tax exclusive price to be $75, the final amount is $100, uh, the tax rate would be 25% in a tax inclusive price. But when we're talking about tax exclusive prices, we would be paying 70, your list price would be $75 tax exclusive 
the customer would pay 33% uh, tax to end up at a final $100 price. So the different scenarios um, that, we, that we see commonly is the tax, tax is excluded. So taxes added at the point of purchase. This is what we're used to in Canada, in the US, you know, your pricing strategy that uh, your 999, you, the customer pays the tax and we don't worry about what the customer pays in the end. The second uh, example that we see is, you know, what I just showed with that. So you want to gear your pricing strategy towards a tax inclusive pricing, but those taxes are deducted off of that tax inclusive price that you provide. So the amount that the publisher has paid is off that, removed off that amount. And the third way of doing things is, uh, it's only used so far we see in, or I'm sure it's used in other places, but where we see it particularly is in Australia and New Zealand. I think everything's evolved a little differently there. This is like the platypus of taxes. So it's when you see a tax inclusive price, but those taxes are added and calculated um, from the base price. So in that example as well, it would be similar to what we would see in a territory such as Canada and the US where that's added to the final amount, except what the customer sees and what the customer pays is that tax inclusive final amount. So one of the things that we see a lot of confusion on is that publishers are trying to provide both prices. They're sending us both the tax inclusive and the tax exclusive price within the same currency. Uh, this is a quote from the Onyx Best Practices Guide that the price composite should specify a price in either tax inclusive or tax exclusive, never both. Um, yet almost every publisher is sending us both. So one of the biggest problems that that has is it's okay if they're facets of the same price. If you're providing a price in VAT and you're saying this is the, the 10, 10 dollar, or sorry, 10 euro price, um, and you're expecting that you're paying, you know, the price that you're providing and that you'll be paid on as the publisher is eight euros based on a 20% tax rate. Similar to states in, in the states or provinces in Canada, in Europe, different countries all have different VAT rates. So if you're basing your tax exclusive price on a 20% tax rate, hoping that that will be you know, parity all across, the VAT rates in Europe vary anywhere between 3% and 23%. So if you're providing those two prices, they're not two facets of the same price. You'll be sending a tax exclusive price for euros and a tax inclusive price, but when you move that across other countries, they no longer match because the 10 euro price in Luxembourg is not an eight euro price exclusive price, it's 970 euros. Um, so I know that all of that sounds really confusing and that's why the whole, uh, the example earlier of the um, you know, the, the best practices sentence of just send one, don't send both. You can just send one, your $14.99 inclusive price, and your retailer will do all the work on the back end. So we will deduct taxes. Um, you can send one $14.99 euro price for all of the countries, and anywhere we sell it, we'll figure out how much we owe you on that. But as a publisher, you need to be aware that you are going to be paid a different amount on each of those sales across each of those countries. Another complexity to this is that taxes change. So the VAT rates are changing quite frequently. There's a lot of discussion in Europe about uh, whether eBooks are you know, software and programs or whether they are book products and culturally protected. We're seeing different countries take different stances on this. Some are saying that they're not subject to VAT. Others are saying they are. Um, in France, the, the VAT rate changed last year. It's changing again. And there are many publishers that still haven't revised their pricing for France. So they're still basing their calculations based on old VAT rates that are no longer used. Another frequent problem we see in international distribution is publishers that are not being explicit with which territories their prices should be used. So a common example we would see is a publisher that would send us a 9.99 US dollar price and a 7.99 British pound price, which is fine um, until they also give us Australian rights. And there's nothing explicit in the data to say what the Australian dollar price should be. Um, you know, at Kobo, we can convert those prices, but if there's nothing to say which price we should convert to, we'll often see some confusion when we report on their sales at the end of the month. Like, why did you use my, seven, my British pound price? You should have converted my US dollar price. If there's nothing in the data to say that, um, then technically the retailer can use either price because they're both considered valid in that territory. What you would want to use is qualifiers on those prices to say in which territories they can be used. So in this example, I've said use this US dollar price in US and Canada. Um, at Kobo, we would convert to the local currency where we have a local store. Uh, but having that explicit uh, 
detail in the data makes it easier for you to know what you can expect to be paid in that territory. But we would also caution you to be careful when adding those applicable territories because we also see publishers limit their sales by not giving us enough valid prices. So if you are taking those US dollar prices saying you can use it in this territory, this territory, and this one, sometimes we would just see a publisher say, here's my US dollar price, use it in the US, and then not mention anywhere else that their pricing can be used. So if we've been provided Canadian rights and British rights, there is no valid price because the data explicitly says that this is the price for the US market without giving any further details. Something that we frequently see is uh, the translation of rights. So when you sign your contracts, it does take several steps to make it into this Onyx composite here. There's a lot that can go wrong within that that we often see some mistranslations happening. So there's often many people that are responsible for different steps, and there's a lot of places where um, certain rights can get lost within the data. So sometimes the communication of rights in the metadata is a duty that might fall to a junior staff member. We've seen a lot of confusion on open market and what that means. Um, there was a major publisher who had given the assignment to someone in their office to translate all their rights into their onyx, and the person didn't know what open market meant, so they just uh, left that out and, and just included all of the explicit countries. It wasn't until investigating, you know, why are these books not for sale in these territories that the publisher realized it had been like that for years. Um, so it is very important to have some understanding about what's going out there. Uh, we also know that a lot of publishers are not uh, creating their metadata in-house. They're using companies or different platforms to enter in these details into like a database that's then exported into Onyx. And the thing about you know any software is that things can go wrong. So you can't just think that because of what it says on your screen is right, that what is going out in your feed is also correct. We have seen issues where a digital asset management service um, had a capacity for only a certain number of countries, and they didn't properly communicate that to their, to their publisher. Um, so the publisher was entering all for their full world rights, but all that was going out in the feed was just the 30 that their system had the capacity to output in Onyx. So you should understand what you're sending and regularly review these issues. Uh, not to say you need to re review each feed, but particularly your key titles. You should make sure that what is going out in the Onyx is matching what's in your system and in your database. Another thing that we frequently see at Kobo dealing with publishers worldwide is understanding of time zones and what they can expect to happen. So as publishers are moving beyond um, weekly updates of metadata. We are seeing a lot of publishers send out daily updates, some of them sending out um, even hourly updates as things change. Uh, there is this kind of quote that wasn't onyx to this until very recently saying that by default time is local to the sender. So at Kobo, this was something that we found particularly confusing because the sender can mean a lot of different things. Is your sender a distributor? Is it your digital asset manager? Is it the publisher itself? And how are the digital asset managers going to communicate what time zone the publisher is in? Um, and it's also very hard as a recipient of this data to understand um, who we received it from when and what time zone that person's in. So this is something that's actually been changed um, so that it is something that's explicitly defined. So by default, time is... Sorry, by default, um, time is, is local to the recipient. So it is something that w if it's not clearly defined, and it should be, if you do want to do a special promotion within certain hours or within certain times, you do need to be clear on which time zone you mean. It's also something that we see frequently in Canada. Um, most recently, we had an issue where a publisher had said, we want this promotion to be available until midnight. Um, for your customers, and we sent out an email in Canada, and they hadn't said it was okay for it to be until midnight for their customers on the West Coast. And customers from Vancouver were trying to purchase this book at the advised price that the publisher had advertised, and it was no longer in effect because that price promotion had ended at midnight EST. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about as well is why you should price locally. Um, because not localizing prices can be a strategy. You might want to say that you don't want to deal with taxes, you don't want to deal with conversion. You will just provide your Canadian dollar price and let your retailers do the conversion for you. Um, there are, we're getting to a point where there are more English language speakers outside of the US and Canada than there are inside um, you know, certain percentages of the population in Asia, in, uh, in India as well, are purchasing a lot of ebooks, and the markets can be very different there. 
at Kobo, something that we always try to talk to publishers about is optimizing their prices and not leaving money on the table. There are There is some tolerance for higher prices in certain territories. Um, a, publish, a customer in Norway will pay much more for digital content than a customer in India, and sometimes it's better to try to target those prices and provide different wholesale pricing for other territories. Another reason that you might want to add local pricing is because of the open market. We're running into a lot of situations now where Kobo does have a localized store where the Canadian edition might be competing directly against the UK edition in countries like, like France and uh, the Netherlands and beyond. And to see those, uh, when you know that a customer might be looking for your book and seeing two editions side by side, do you know if your edition is cheaper than the competing edition? Um, maybe that's something that you do want to take control of so and be aware of what theirs is listed at. This is also something that we wanted to prepare to show you of um, where our sales, where our English language sales are happening. So this is kind of country by country, that the countries that Kobo has a localized storefront in and where we're seeing the most English language content sell. Um, so right now we're mainly seeing publishers do a fairly good job of serving a lot of kind of traditional English language territories. I think publishers in Canada are quite familiar with pricing for both the UK and US market. Um, we're seeing a lot of publishers start to begin to experiment with Australian and New Zealand prices, but we're not seeing a lot of Euro prices. Um, and that excludes some key territories like Ireland, who everyone always seems to forget is on the Euro and that they're not using the GBP pricing. Um, and also something that you'll notice on this chart that's quite surprising, or it was surprising to, to me reviewing it, was the Netherlands being almost 40% English language content. Um, there are also some emerging English language markets such as South Africa that Kobo's recently launched in that we're seeing a lot of success of English language content that's maybe worth looking at the South African RAND. Another important issue when discussing localized pricing is agency terms. Um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, and most agency contracts do come with the uh, requirement that you are pricing in the territories that you're selling in. So I know that contracts vary from, from retailer to retailer, and I can't speak to what everyone's contract says explicitly. But one of the key parts of agency is usually price parity and ensuring that all of your agents have the same price. And if you're not providing a local price, if you're providing a Canadian agency price and you want that to be used in Europe, um, are all of your agents using the same exchange rates? Are they all updating at the most uh, at the same um, at the same time? How frequently are they doing it? And will they undercut a cheaper price if it's found? Because we've also had instances of publishers where um, you know certain competitors are matching the converted price, which isn't the price that the publishers provided. So what we wanted to get to, what I wanted to get to now is kind of some currency overviews. I think that everyone is very familiar with Canadian pricing and, and how that works here. Um, you're all very familiar with our partner here in Canada, Indigo Books and Music. Um, that, I'm going to talk about the average selling price. I know that the average selling price can be a little bit different because we're talking about everything from self-published content to agency bestsellers, but my goal in showing some of the average prices is to give you a sense of both currency exchange and to also compare them to each other to see which countries are maybe have tolerance for higher price than others. So the US market, um, we were partnered with Borders, uh, as some of you may know. Um, we've recently relaunched in the US while we've continued to serve it as a localized storefront. Um, much of the power, as I mentioned before, comes from having devices available to book to, to readers and people that are shopping in bookstores. So our recent partner in the US is now the ABA. So just before Christmas, we launched with independent bookstores across the US. So these bookstores can sell Kobo devices. When someone on those devices purchases books, the, the independent bookstore gets a cut of that. We've also launched a similar agreement with Family Christian. So by providing Kobo with US rights, your titles are also available on the, the sites of those bookstores as well. Um, and we're seeing the average, U, the average US selling price at about $7.59. Um, and with that being at parity, it's the same in Canada, in Canadian dollars, sorry. So to talk a bit about British pounds, British pounds are uh, tax and currency. The VAT rate currently in the, in the UK is a 20% VAT. 
So in the UK, we're partnered with WH Smith, one of the largest booksellers there. We are also um, just ramping up a similar agreement to what we have done in the US with the ABA with the Booksellers Association in the UK. So in the UK, we'll be doing a similar agreement with their independent bookstores. And we're seeing an average selling price of about uh, £3.75, which is about £5.94 Canadian. Um, so this is Australian dollars here. So in the Australian market, we are partnered with Collins and with Angus and Robertson. Again, this is a territory that's almost, uh, almost only English content. And we're seeing prices here on average of about 8.53 Australian dollars, which are about 8.82 Canadian. So in the New Zealand, New Zealand, uh, we're seeing New Zealand dollars. Again, this is another place where we see a lot of confusion and we see a lot of publishers sending us Australian dollars to use in this market. Um, but New Zealand is similar to kind of uh, the Canada to Australia where no one's really providing localized prices for them. Um, in New Zealand, our partner is Whitcools and we're seeing some average selling prices of about 1047, which is 878 Canadian. So we've recently launched in South Africa um, I really like their currency with all of the animals. I thought that was, it was really interesting to look at some of these. Um, we've launched with Pick and Pay, which is similar to like a Walmart in South Africa. So they're selling our devices in stores. They're directing people through our, through their website as well. So that's who your books are with if, if you provide Kobo with South African rights. Um, the currency that they use there is the Rand and the average price is about 58.46 Rand, which unfortunately is not 58.46 dollars. Um, it's about 660 Canadian. So um, euros, again, it gets a little bit complicated because we are using euros across multiple territories. We're using it at multiple VAT rates. Um, and as mentioned, our recommendation there is that you do provide one localized euro price um, for all territories. And that would mean, though, being paid different amounts across all different countries. Uh, you can put the effort into price uniquely to each of those euro territories. Um, but it, you know that does depend on your pricing strategy. And we are seeing kind of some of the similar average sell prices across those. So um, as I mentioned, Ireland being one of those overlooked territories that does sell in the Euro. Um, in Ireland, we're also with WH Smith. They do have stores uh, in Ireland and along with the UK uh, the Booksellers Association agreement that I spoke of. So in Ireland, we're seeing average prices of about 560 euros, which are about 750 Canadian dollars. And again, these are the average prices that includes both the low price and the agency new releases. These are sales of English language content in these territories though. So in France, we have a fantastic partner with FNAC. FNAC is um, you know, one of the largest bookstores in France. Uh, they also are a, lar a big um, digital store. People will go there to buy devices and tablets and computers. Uh, in, in France, um, we're seeing a 6% VAT rate there. So like I said, the VAT rates across Europe tend to vary widely. We're seeing about a 655 price, uh, euro price, which is 877 Canadian. So in Italy, we've just launched with Mondadori. Mondadori is, again, the largest bookseller in Italy. They are, interestingly, also a publisher. So Mondadori is one of the largest publishers within Italy. They're also a large magazine and media company. We're seeing average selling rates in Italy of 655, which is 877 Canadian, very similar to France. In Germany, we're seeing only about 20% uh, of sales as English language titles. Um, we're seeing that at uh, 661 as being the average selling price in euros, which is, again, exactly uh, 855 Canadian. So in the Netherlands, as mentioned, this was a little bit interesting to see the amount of uh, English language content they're consuming. We're seeing about 40% of their purchases being English language titles. Um, and we're seeing a, a slightly higher uh, average selling price of 709 euros, which is a 950 uh, Canadian dollar rate. So in Brazil, we've recently launched uh, with our partner there, who is Lavaria Cultura. Um, they've been a fantastic partner. Something that we've all found really interesting at Kobo is that we're seeing a much different device mix. So everywhere else across the world, um, our Glow device is the most popular. But in uh, Brazil, they love the, the Kobo Mini. They've even, the media's given it a nickname. They call it the Cobinho. Um, <laughs> so it's been uh, kind of interesting over there. Um, we're seeing about a 33% of uh, their sales are English language content. Um, the Real, we're seeing an average selling price in 1985, which is about 10.09 um, Canadian dollars. Interestingly, this was also the highest average sell price that we were seeing. And 
when we looked at that, much of the content that they're buying there, they're buying a lot of STM content. So the Brazilian market is interested in uh, English language technical and business titles. So in Japan, um, we've recently launched in, or we launched in Japan last summer with our parent company, Rakuten. So we've been selling there uh, since last summer. In Japan, they use the yen, and probably the most frequent issue we see with publishers when they are attempting to price in yen is that they're providing decimal places. Um, and that's not used. One yen is a similar kind of a set of to, to a cent, although it is worth a little more. Um, we're seeing average selling prices of about uh, 656 yen, which is 709 Canadian dollars. So to kind of sum up some of the issues that we're seeing, what we would really like to see publishers do is be explicit with their data and avoid some of those ambiguous composites that we mentioned before, and to be aware of what's being sent out and to experiment often with that. Um, we do accept as frequent metadata updates as anyone would like to provide, and uh, you can change your pricing very easily. So thank you.